back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and to click on that bell notification. That way, when we're doing our thing, YouTube lets you know. Today, I continue my top 100 board games of all time, and in particular, I'll be covering games number 30 through 21. So let's get straight to it with my number 30 board game of all time, new to the list this year, and that is... Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. For those who follow this channel for a while, you might have noticed I am a huge deck building fan. And if you check my entire top 100, there are going to be lots of games that fall within this genre. Now, this one in particular is within the system of legendary games that started with Marvel Legendary and has very similar mechanisms, but it has a different focus, a different direction. First of all, on the playmat, you don't have a city, you have a complex. And also, when alien cards or enemy cards enter that complex, they enter face down. So there's a whole new element of gameplay in this game where you're using your attack not only to defeat the aliens that have been revealed, but you're using it to scan the complex, which really means you're going to peek and flip a card over and know whether it's an alien or some other card event or hazard that you have to interact with as a player, as a group of players. This is a completely cooperative board game, and the base game comes with enough characters and enemies to simulate all the different uh, movies, or at least the four original alien movies, and there's some expansions for those who are interested in subsequent movies. Really cool. Again, I just love the system of, of gameplay here. Uh, I love the intrigue of trying to figure out when those aliens are coming, and also just the, the fear that is instilled in this game as you reveal it and you find out that not only is it an alien, but it's a big, ugly, gruesome one that you're going to have a hard time combating. And as the game progresses, the difficulty of the characters that are revealed increases as well. Really cool. If you like the intellectual property, if you like deck building game, if you like cooperative board games, this is one to consider. My number 30 board game of all time, Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. Now we move on to my number 29, also new to the list this year, and that is Android Netrunner. Originally designed by Richard Garfield, but this re-implementation is by Lucas Litzinger and published by Fantasy Flight Games. And I must admit, I'm a big fan of living card games, and this currently is the number one ranked living card game on my list, so don't wait for any others. I love the thematic implementation of this game. Basically, one side of the... Uh, this is a two-player only game. One player is taking the role of the evil corporations, and there's a few corporations you could choose from, right? You're in this dystopian, futuristic uh, universe, and basically, the other player will take on the role of the hacker or the runner who's trying to break in, break ices, and hack or enter into the different servers of the corporation in order to steal away their agendas. And basically, it's a race to the finish. The uh, runner's trying to steal a certain amount of points worth of agendas, and the corporation is trying to complete those same agendas. And the cool thing about this game is that it's so thematic, perhaps to a fault, because the terminology for all the different aspects of gameplay differ from one side to the other, right? The, the name that you use for your hand, for your discard pile, uh, for your deck, for your tableau, all of these things differ from one side to the other. Really cool, really fun. Again, uh, if you like that two-player tactical type of card game, like Magic the Gathering, which again, Richard Garfield, the original designer, is known for Magic the Gathering. If you like that type of game and are interested in pursuing something else with a science fiction theme as opposed to fantasy, this might be one you want to consider. My number 29 board game of all time, Android Netrunner. Now we move on to my number 28. And this is also new to the list this year. So we have a couple consecutive games that are newbies. And my number 28 is Summoner Wars. And this is the master set here designed by Colby Douch and published by Plat Hat Games. This here is a tactical card game, very much like Android Netrunner and some of these other LCGs, but this is not an LCG. Um, but what's interesting about this game is that you have your playmat here which adds a spatial element to the cards, right? Because unlike Magic the Gathering and Android Netrunner and some of these other uh, co tactical card games which are just placing cards face down on your tableau, and they remain there until they're eliminated or until you discard them for some other reason. Here in this game, you place your cards on these mats, on the different spaces in the mat, different grids here, and you can move them. Yes, when you don't just attack your opponent willy-nilly, you need to move your character cards through these different uh, spaces on the map 
And you either have to be adjacent to an opponent that you're trying to defeat if you're trying to attack melee, or if you're within three spaces away, you can attack range if your character has a ranged ability. And you're doing all the same things that a lot of these other tactical card games have, but again, you have the spatial manipulation, which I find very intriguing, and your attack is not based simply on just the character stats, even though that is a big deal, but you're also, the character stats determine how many dice you roll. So yes, you're doing some good old fashioned dice rolling in order to resolve conflict. And usually I'm not a big fan of dice rolling for conflict unless it's neat or at least um, very player friendly. And I find that that is the case in this game because you have a two out of three chance of each of your dice being hits because you roll um, six siders, D6s, and anything that's three or higher constitutes as a hit. Really cool, and it has a really neat system where at the end of each round, you can voluntarily discard cards from your hand that you may or may not be interested in in order to build up your magic pool, which is the same currency that you're using later on to summon your characters and place them on your playmat. Also, every time you defeat an enemy, that enemy goes onto your magic pile. So again, that's a different way of accumulating that currency, so to speak, in order to use it for your benefit. Really cool, nice combination of mechanisms, nice combination of variety of characters that come just in the base game, the different factions. And of course, there's always uh, expansion content out there for those who are interested in acquired more material. My number 28 board game of all time, Summoner Wars. My number 27 board game of all time is not new to the list. This game was actually ranked number 21 last year, so it's not dropped too much. That is Coliseum, designed by Wolfgang Kramer and Marcus Lutke. And this reprint is by Tasty Minstrel Games. This is a auction bidding game. Well, auction bidding is involved in the game where players are each running their own coliseum, right? Their own arena. And they're putting on performances. And there's pre-made performances that are come in the game. And all of these performances, these different events, they require a specific amount of resources, which are represented by different tiles. And throughout the game, you're having these auctions. There's five rounds. You're having these auctions, and you're trying to acquire these resources. And also, you're engra engaging a little bit of trade in order to complete as many of these resources as possible because the more resources you have on the required event tile, the more spectators will come to see your performance. The more of those resources you're missing, the more spectators will be uh, subtracted from your ultimate um, potential as far as that event is concerned. Now you're doing all these other different things in order to attract spectators. You're buying season tickets. You are trying to have the best performances to add podiums to your arena which will add more uh spectators in the future you're trying to attract the attention of senators and consuls and even the emperor himself to come to your arena to again add an increase to the total amount of spectators because the spectators you get to come to your event that's how much coins you're going to get at the end of that round in order to use in the future round for your purchases and for your auctions but also that's how much points you're going to have and what's interesting in this game is that the score is not cumulative you do not add every event or every performance from round to round and have the sum of it all at the end of the five rounds instead your highest scoring round will be your final round and more almost always your fourth and fifth round fourth or fifth round are your highest score if for whatever reason your third round is your highest score there's a very good chance you're not going to win the game as a matter of fact more often than not you're going to need your fifth one to be the highest one because it's going to have the most potential you're going to need your fifth one to be the highest one in order to win this game really cool some nice auction bidding some nice trading and again just that promise of trying to get the right combination of resources in order to put your performance or pull off your performance to its highest efficiency possible my number 27 board game of all time coliseum and now we move on to my 26 and this is also not new to the list this was number 16 last year so it's dropped down 10 spaces considering the fact that i played over 83 games this past year that's not too bad my number 26 is kikladis designed by bruno Cathala and ludovic mablanc and published by madigo games this is a greek theme civilization area control game where players are also partaking in an auction at the beginning of each round in order to win over the favor of the gods. It's a offering to the Greek gods and you have the pantheon of gods in the base game. You have Zeus and you have Poseidon, you have Ares and you have Athena and you have Apollo. And Apollo is kind of like a consolation prize. He's always available while the other four gods will cycle. Really cool game because you're trying to do this auction, but players can increase your auction uh, or, or the bid for a particular god, bumping you off 
and forcing you to bid for another God at that very instant, right? So calculating all this and figuring out and almost um, anticipating what your opponents may want, what God they may want, and whether or not they'll be able to outbid you, right? Because the money is behind a screen, so it's secret information. You may or may not know. You might have an idea as to who's wealthy or who's not. Really cool because you're fighting for control of the Kiklades Islands here, and basically you're using Ares to summon up troops, you're using P Poseidon to summon up naval forces, and you're doing a lot of this battling. Uh, you do a little bit of rolling of a die to battle and comparing the numbers and all that. But ultimately, what you want to do is you want to control two or three metropolises at the end of the game uh, based on who, uh, how many, the player count. And there's different ways of, of, of building a metropolis. You could either build the four different types of buildings that are generically available in the game that will eventually turn into a metropolis. Or you can turn in a certain amount of philosopher cards, which are acquired through the goddess Athena, and that will acquire you a metropolis. Or you can simply defeat and destroy an enemy, take over his island that already has a, a metropolis on it. So there's a couple different ways you could go about it. Now, I like this game a lot. It would probably go up my list actually even higher than 26, believe it or not, because I love this game so much at a three or higher player count. But I mostly play this two players because I like it so much that I just want to get in my get my Kiklati's fix even if I only have one other person to play with but if I played this three or more players often I think I would like it more I do have plans on teaching this to my nephews and niece which are uh, some of the people that I play in bigger groups more often so I think this has a good chance of at least solidifying its spot going forward into future years my number 26 board game of all time Kiklati's and now we move on to my number 25 guys we're in the top 25 percent my number 25 board game, also not new to the list. Last year, this was ranked number 20. And this year, it's ranked number 25. And that is Race for the Galaxy by Thomas Lehman and published by Real Grand Games. And two of the reasons why this game uh, was able to really sustain its spot. It's only dropped five spots considering all the new games. Two of the reasons why is because of the two modules that are available in the first expansion the gathering storm expansion um and i know that race for the galaxy gets a lot of flack for its expansions but i found the expansions to be very intriguing first of all it has a solo module i like playing solo and i find this solo variant in the in the gathering storm expansion to be so functional and you have such a competent ai as a matter of fact you have a variable ai because you have like six or seven different modules within the ai um player to choose so you could vary their strategies and what have you really cool um i also like the um race mechanism the race module there where players are trying to be the first or the most to complete certain objectives and they get some bonus points some bonus tiles for three points or maybe even five points depending on whether or not they can accomplish those be the first to accomplish a certain thing or or have the most of a certain thing at the end of the game so that gives you something else to aim for as you're doing all this stuff this is a nice cool variable phase order simultaneous play plays really quickly in 30 minutes gives you a nice little crunchy feel for what is a short game and yes i only play this with a few people because the symbology or the iconography on the cards can be a little bit complex and if you don't play it with frequency and play it a good amount of times you're going to have a hard time remembering what all the symbols mean but once you make it there and you're playing with other people who already have made it to the top of the mountain this game does not last too long really cool my number 25 board game of all time race for the galaxy and now we move on to my number 24 also in last year's list and it was number 15 so this and race for the galaxy were 15 and 16 last year and now they're 24 and 25 this year so they stay right next to each other my number 24 is cuba designed by michael Renek and stefan stadler and published by rio grand games this is a really cool game with a similar theme and idea to the massively popular Puerto Rico. I personally prefer this. Better artwork, better graphic design. Michael Menzel makes this beautiful board. Um, better components. And I like the gameplay as well. First of all, you have a Caribbean island, Cuba, as opposed to Puerto Rico. And you're producing all these resources and shipping them uh, in order to gain victory points. Very similar. But a lot of the stuff that's going on is slightly different. First of all, you have this nice little hacienda board where you manipulate your worker in order to trigger the production of different goods and, and or resources. <clears throat> also, later as the game progresses, you're doing a little bit of city building and you're buying different uh, buildings that you're also placing on your hacienda to replace those resource spots. But those city buildings also will give you 
special abilities and trigger special benefits as you trigger them in the future rounds. So you'll also be manipulating your worker in order to trigger those buildings. And they're going to give you victory points. They're going to give you uh, uh, abilities to convert resources, score victory points for them, and what have you. Now, this game also has a really cool uh, political element to it, where at the end of each round, you're playing through five cards. You always have the same five cards to pick from. And you're only going to pick four for each round. So you're going to take four actions. But you're going to have one unplayed card. And each character card not only gives you a different ability, but they also have a different amount of votes for parliament at the end of the round. And you're gonna take those votes that, of the unplayed card, add any secret bid that you might want to have with your uh, with your coins, and that will be your votes in parliament. And whoever has the most votes in parliament at the end of the round is going to activate two of out of four potential bills and pass them into laws. And these laws are basically different ways of benefiting your scoring, right? So if you are the player who wins the vote in parliament, you're obviously going to choose the laws that benefit you the most for scoring, right? You're going to see how this law works with what you have, your possessions, your resources, what have you, and how that can ultimately end and result in you benefiting more than your opponents. You're obviously not going to pick laws that will benefit them more. So it's really cool. You have a nice supply and demand resource market. I always like when games have that. Again, a beautiful board. You have the ships in harbor that tell you their supply and demand. And the coolest thing about them is that they are there's always four visible. So they rank in different orders as far as how much victory points they'll get you. But you can anticipate long term what resources might be more valuable going forward in the future and invest towards them. So many really cool elements. This game is out of print. So perhaps you shouldn't get too excited. But you could, if you could find it. For a decent price, secondhand, this is a good game to consider. My number 24 board game of all time, Cuba. My number 23 board game of all time is also not new to the list, and that it was number 15 last year, and that is Pandemic, designed by Matt Leacock and published by Z-Man Games. I have two boxes here because I have my In the Lab expansion and I have my regular box here I keep Everything from the base game and the On the Brink expansion. And here I have some of the leftover content from In the Lab. And basically, these expansions have helped keep F Pandemic a fresh experience for me. I do uh, love cooperative games. A lot of people that watch my channel and out there don't really get the whole cooperative craze. I am not as big of a fan of cooperative games as some other people are. Some people, that's their favorite genre. But I do like my cooperative games, especially when they're challenging. And Pandemic, if you add the right amount of modules, it can be a very challenging experience. It's true that the base game, eventually you may or may not get to the point where you feel like you're mastering it. But again, the On the Brink module uh, or the On the Brink modules add lots of weight, lots of meat, lots of uh, complex, challenging decisions that you have to make. And the In the Lab actually adds a sideboard, a side game almost, uh, with some spatial manipulation that you have to figure out as you're maneuvering cubes through these uh, petri dishes here in order to collect samples and eventually find cures for your disease. Uh, very thematic, albeit abstracted, but again, it adds to a nice, cool element to the game. And I'll admit, I had the In the Lab, I'm a big fan of the In the Lab expansion, but it's not a always must play. While lots of the modules from On the Brink are kind of must play. I feel like I either have to play with the Virulent Strain expansion or the uh, Purple Virus module. If I don't play with either one or the other, uh, chances are I'm playing with a newbie or a person that's very fresh to gaming and Pandemic in particular, and it's a gateway experience. But if I'm playing with experienced gamers, I am playing with those modules. Also, the In the Lab adds a solo module, which I find to be neat and interesting. It's nothing amazing or incredible, but it's a way of playing solo. You have the CDC itself as your AI um ally against the game it's pretty challenging and if you want to scratch the pandemic itch without having to control multiple characters it gives you an alternative for that my number 23 board game of all time pandemic and now we move on to my number 22 and my number 22 is new to the list this year it has been a grail game for me for quite some time and i finally got to play it almost a year ago and that is Carcassonne the Castle, designed by Reiner Knizia and originally published by Real Grand Games. But as I mentioned, this is a grail game for me because it's been out of print for many, many years. Um, this game here, first of all, for those who have been watching, yes, I did include Carcassonne as my, 
I'm not telling you. You got to cash that for yourself. But it has been already mentioned on this list. Cargo's on the Castle, on the other hand, is to me different enough to warrant having it separately on this list. First of all, it's a different designer, Ryan Knizia. And second of all, it adds some elements that deviate from typical Carcassonne. First of all, you have a limitation. You have a fixed space that you're working with. Carcassonne, the premise of Carcassonne is that the world is your oyster. You build the board as you go. That's happening here too, but you have the confines of the castle walls in order to build. And basically you start the game with the castle walls there and the castle walls also serve as your scoring track and you're placing the tiles now it has some really cool neat innovations that i find interesting first of all i like the fact that there's some startup tiles already placed on the walls with get with give you a lot of options starting the game because carcassonne regular carcassonne early on in the game you have very few decisions right you're, the game is kind of playing you but with cargos on the castle right from the get-go you have options as to where to place your tiles also i like the manipulation of the scoring track because the scoring track the castle walls uh, are divided into several corners and each of these corners have these bonus tokens that if you manage a way to score exactly enough to land on that corner and there's always two scores uh two numbers a range of two numbers uh, on that corner so you have a good chance if you map out your turns and decisions wisely if you land exactly on those corners you snatch up those bonus tiles and those bonus tiles give you different ways of scoring points at the end of the game different uh benefits and bonuses that other your, your opponent will not have now this is a two-player only game as opposed to carcassonne uh regular carcassonne but the fact is i actually prefer vastly to play carcassonne two players it feels more tactical it feels more strategic it feels kind of like a little bit of a chess match which is why i play cargo zone to begin with so i don't even mind the fact that this is two player only uh really cool it has a neat catch-up mechanism but something you want to guard for because if you uh have the biggest house if you build the biggest house you're going to score points equal to all of the empty spaces at the end of the ca at, at, at the end of the game within the castle and there's always going to be like 16 17 empty spaces so that's a lot of extra points that you can score if you're falling behind or if you're in the lead to solidify and guarantee your win you want to go for that my number 22 board game of all time carcassonne the castle and now for the last one on today's list my number 21 also not new to the list it was number 19 last year so it's down two spots only so basically this game has not changed my number 21 board game of all time is the Pursuit of Happiness, designed by David Chirkop and Adrian Abella, and published by Stronghold and Artipia Games. This is a worker placement game with the Game of Life theme on it. Now, first of all, I know a lot of people give this game a hard time, but I enjoy this game. First of all, I love the theme. I like the way it's done. I like the fact that you start with a different character trait at the beginning of each uh, game that basically guides you as to what decisions are most beneficial for you but also help you to immerse yourself in the experience because if you are a rich snob or if you are a nerd you kind of want to carry out your life and make your decisions based on that and also make the optimal decisions to, to win the game now this game has a lot of resource acquisition and resource conversion which i really like you're gaining all these different types of resources you have money you have um, um influence you have creativity you have knowledge and you're gaining them in order to accomplish different um, objectives. But you're also, as the game progresses, you're converting one into another to your convenience. Whenever you need more creativity, if you could change, exchange some knowledge in order to acquire some creativity, you'll do so. You're um, starting careers. You're trying to climb up the ladder in your career professionally. You're finding a significant other to date with, maybe even marry and start a family with. You are um, acquiring different... Um, material things right different goods different uh activities and events that you're going to you're taking part in different projects but you have to be careful because if you take too much upon yourself then you're going to accrue stress and stress is slowly going to kill you just like in real life now this game in theory has eight rounds but realistically it's almost impossible to get to an eighth round i've never had it done i've only seen a person go to the seventh round once because each round represents a decade of your life and you may or may not make it to all those decades if towards the end of the game, your stress levels are too high. So early on in the game, you might want to make some decisions that limit your stress intake or at least uh, waivers back and forth that as you accrue stress, you also do things to relax and maybe de-stress. Really cool, really fun. Again, very thematic. I like the mechanisms, but of course the theme adds the charm 
to the game uh, that sometimes is missing from this type of Euro worker placement game. My number 21 board game of all time, The Pursuit of Happiness. And that's it, folks. That is my list for today. Thank you for watching. Consider clicking on one of these videos on the screen. If YouTube is showing them to you, it's because there's a really good chance that you will like one of them. Also, check in the description down below to find a link to my Patreon and see how you could become a patron, support this channel, and be more involved with the behind the scenes process. Research and find a tier that works for you. This is Harry saying take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming. Bye-bye.